So, Job chapter 19. Here's Job then with all his difficulties and all his suffering and sense that this is unjust, that this is not how it should be. It's all unfair, and of course, in a sense, it was. And he says, verse 2, <clears throat> How long are you going to break me in pieces with your words? One of the tragedies of the book of Job is the way that the friends break him apart with their words. And so, you, simple takeaway lesson from that is that words are powerful. And a lot of Job's sufferings really were a result of the, the words of these friends, so-called. Because they were so sure that they were right and you're wrong. Come on, fess up, you've sinned. That's why you're suffering, because you've sinned. It wasn't quite completely like that. And so it went on and on, and they got more and more worked up and more and more persuaded. And Jesus says that according to our words we'll be judged, according to our words we'll be condemned or justified. The proverb says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you know what James says about the tongue. And so you have power because you have a tongue. And in these days of the internet, you can use your words, just sending messages and so forth, just as you can use your physical tongue. And these words are so significant. You can destroy people with your words. And you can encourage them and save them. And we may feel that I have no money, I'm nothing, I am of no influence, I am absolutely a nobody, I have nothing to contribute. Well, actually you do, because you've got a tongue. And you have more power than you think. And many folks think that they're poor, that they're on the edge of whatever, and they can't do anything or be anything. Well, you can, because the words of a person are so powerful. Then he says, verse 4, If indeed I have sinned, then my sin remains with myself. Well, Job does respond well to a lot of this situation, but he doesn't respond perfectly, and he does mess up at times. So he's now saying, as a lot of people say today, well, if I sin, well, that's my business, none, none of your business. It just remains with myself. And he says, if I have sinned, well, it's just with me. Well, at the end of the book, he comes to recognize that he has done wrong. He puts his hand upon his mouth and says, I have not said the right thing. I am a sinner. I repent in dust and ashes. And in a sense, if you see what I'm saying, it's kind of harder for somebody who is righteous in the eyes of the world, like Job was a just and upright man. God says that. But he wasn't perfect because only Jesus was perfect. It's harder for people who are, dare I say it, a bit like us, who compared to the ungodly of the world, the societies in which we live, are a bit more righteous than them. It's harder for us to be convicted of personal sin, that we are still sinners. And because we're that little bit much better than the people around us, we can easily think that, therefore, I'm some sort of uh, better than them. And we're not. And this is, the, this is the entire point, that we're not better at all. And so Job has to realize that. He has to be convicted of his sinfulness. And he has to come to this realization. And I, I think this is a path for all of us, for the relatively good living people to be convicted of our sin. And then when you feel that forgiveness, you find that energy, you find that, that appreciation of grace, you find that gratitude. So he then says, verse 6, God has overthrown me, the uh, AV says. Well, it's actually the word for pervert. God has perverted me. And I, I think this is sort of answered, really, by Elihu, because he picks up Job's words here when he says, God has uh, perverted me. When Elihu says in Job 34, verse 12, God will not do wickedly, neither will the Almighty pervert judgment. So what he's saying, what Elihu is saying, is, look, that wasn't right. And sure, he does say things that are wrong about God. I know the AV says God has overthrown me, but the sense is God has perverted me. It's God's fault. He's twisted me. And although he does say wrong things, and Elihu, the role of Elihu is, I think, to point that out to us. 
That then leads up to this amazing statement from God at the end of it all that my servant Job spoke about me that which was right. And yet Elihu has just shown us that he didn't always speak what was right about God. So how can God say that somebody is right when in fact they're not? And this is, of course, the, the wonderful message that Paul talks about in the New Testament, that we are counted righteous, as he says, imputed righteousness. So although we are sinners, we are counted by God as if we are righteous. And this is the, uh, this is the, the thing that is so hard to believe about the gospel, because it seems incredible. How could I, as a dysfunctional, mixed-up sinner, be looked at by God as if I don't have any sin. Well, how we get there is by baptism into Jesus. Because when we're baptised into Jesus, we are covered with him. We are looked at as if we are him. We are clothed in white clothing and, and, and so forth. And really to count someone as righteous is a way of loving them. That we love someone and then therefore we count them as righteous how many times here in this hall have i spoken to women who are about to marry someone who is an alcoholic and i have said to them you realize uh, <laughs> that he drinks ah uh, yes 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 i realize he drinks uh, but he's a lovely guy he's wonderful okay sure but you realize he drinks and that has consequence right has he beaten you up yet oh yeah yeah he has but but he he was drunk you know and you think, okay, so, you, it's not that love is blind. It's that love does count the beloved as if they're wonderful. Now, that is a function of love. And so God loves us, and he counts us as if we are righteous. And you've got a parade example here with Job. He does say things about God that were wrong. And Elihu functions, as I say, in the story to point that out. But then he is preparing the way for God to say, Job spoke about me what was right. Well, he didn't, but God counted him as right. The same with Israel. When they left Egypt, went through the Red Sea, they took with them the idols of Egypt. They carried the star of their god Remphan, and they carried the tabernacle of Yahweh, and also the tabernacle of Moloch. Acts 7, Stephen says that, quoting from Amos. And yet, God saw them... In Numbers 23, 21, we're told he did not behold any iniquity in Israel. He saw them as if they were perfect, although they were not. And it is so difficult to, to feel, to believe. But it turns out in practice that as you walk down the street, instead of thinking and feeling that I'm nothing, that I'm just dysfunctional and I haven't made a great job of life, uh, maybe uh, that I'm sure is true of all of us, but... Someone loves you, and someone thinks you're great. And that someone is God in heaven, through Jesus. And this is, this is where the gospel is too good news. Gospel means good news, and it's almost too good to believe that he sees me like that. Well, he then says, Job says, verse 7, I cry out about wrong, and I'm not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no justice. So he's complaining about God. I keep crying out to God, and I don't get any reply, and I don't get any justice. I said that at the end of the book of Job, God himself appears and answers Job out of the whirlwind. And he answers this specifically in Job chapter 38. And that chapter begins, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And if you read his comments, God's comments, he um, is picking up... Uh, what Job has said. And he talks about, the, God talks about the raven. And he says, who provides for the raven his food? This is Job 38, 41. His young ones cry to God and they wander for lack of food. So he says, sometimes the raven and the little ravens cry to God because they think they're not getting any food. But the bottom line of Job 38 is that God sustains all of creation, including the ravens, by his grace. And the love of God is seen throughout the natural creation. So, Job says, I cry out to God for justice, and I don't get any answer. 
And God's answer to that is, okay, Job, think about the ravens. They cry out to me. They also think that I'm a hard God, that I, I don't give them what they want. But they're still alive. I preserve the whole wonderful system by my grace. And so this is a window, if you like, a perspective on the apparent silence of God. We pray, no answer. We pray, we cry out to God, let us pray. Apparently, no answer. This is not to say that God is not there. This is not at all to say that. It's like he says, the ravens, they cry out to me as well. I think I don't hear, but I do. I look after them. They're still around. I give them what they need. And my grace is through the whole system. Then he, he complains, God has fenced up my way that I cannot pass. Now the books of the Bible are not arranged chronologically, and it seems that Job was one of the earliest of the books of the Bible. And this is exactly the situation with Balaam. You'd remember Balaam is on his donkey, and an angel, invisible to him to start with, stands in the way and blocks up his way that he can't pass. And here, Job says, that's what God did to me. And I think that that's one reason to think that Job's Satan was in fact an angel, just like the angel that stood in the path of Balaam is also called a Satan, an adversary. That's all it means. There are no evil angels. There's no, in the sense of sinful angels. Um, but that's how he felt. And he set darkness in my paths, and he complains he destroyed me on every side, and so on. He's saying that life didn't work out. And these days, in the days of Facebook and everything, people like to make their profiles or cut their profile in life like, I'm having a great life. Pictures of you and your kids and, and this and that. And I had a great time and I went here and I did that. And everyone gives the impression that I'm having a great life. But no one does. Because life does not go for all of us, the way we hoped it would. And we are all brought down. Just what happened to Job. God stands in our way and blocks our path at times. And why is this? Why doesn't life work out? Why is it, for example, that the guy who is a mechanic, who spent all his life working as a mechanic, makes a stupid mistake? Why is it that the guy who is a very good dentist who spent his life fixing people's teeth makes a stupid mistake. Why is it that, I don't know, you worked well in your company, you were a good employee, and you got blamed for stealing money, and you didn't steal any money? Why is it that you can work so hard in a church, get thrown out of it? You didn't do what you're accused of. Why is it that people can be the best husband or wife and then their partner goes and has an affair? I mean, why? Why do these things happen? It's because God says that he must bring us down, that he might lift us up. And Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And that due time is not in this world. It's when Jesus comes back at the resurrection. So I think Peter's saying, look, get with the process. Get with it. This is the game plan of God to bring you down in this life, that he might bring you up forever and ever. So don't kick and fight and struggle against that hand that's bringing you down. Work with it. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might lift you up. And so don't be surprised if life does not work out. It actually isn't going to work out. And that, that is where I would say that the prosperity gospel taught by a lot of Pentecostals is one of the worst false teachings out. And I don't like particularly criticizing other people's teachings, but I really think that that's wrong. The idea that if you believe in God, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, you're going to have a fantastic time. And when anyone says to you, how are you? You say, oh, awesome. Oh, it's fantastic. And my life is just amazing. I Rubbish, sorry, but I mean rubbish. Because your life's not amazing. No, and you're going to die one day. God won't give you health all the time, because you're going to die, because we're mortal, right? And this isn't so. The, the opposite is actually the case. And you look at the example of God's son. You look at the example of Job. You look at the example of so many people. 
we are brought down, that we might be exalted in due time and get with the process. See that, expect this is going to happen. Don't kick and fight and cavil against it all the time. Then Job says, verse 10, he has removed my hope like a tree. I got no hope. In another place, he says, well, a, a tree has got hope if it's cut down because it will sprout again. But then we just read in 25, at the end of this chapter, I know that my Redeemer lives. He will stand at the latter day upon the earth and I will see God for myself, etc. So he's sort of going up and down. One minute he believes, the next minute he like, oh, I don't have any hope. This up and down. And we might think, well, yeah, that's me. My faith is up and down. I believe and then I don't believe. We're like the man who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Well, yeah, we believe and we don't believe, unbelief, at the same time. That is unfortunately how it is, and it's how it, it was with Job. But he was justified in the end. And then he starts to describe how he feels and what's happened to him. Verse 13, he has put my brothers far from me, my acquaintance are estranged from me, my relatives have gone away from me, my familiar friends have, have forgotten me. Even my own family count me like a stranger. These words are repeated in Psalm 69. Pretty well word for word they're repeated in Psalm 69. And you think, well, what, yeah, what's Psalm 69? Psalm 69 is a prophecy of Jesus on the cross. Particularly at that moment, at the very, very end, yeah, he was on the cross for eight hours, and at the very end, his mother and the women, who I think were probably his aunties, but that's another story, his mother and those other women and John go away from him. And in the very final end, he is alone. And those words all came true of Jesus at the very end. They were standing by the cross, Mary, his mother, and those women, who I think were his aunties, and John. And he sends them away from him. And it was at that very final, awful, lonely moment when these words came true in the Psalm 69. And what I'm saying is that Job, therefore, we could say was a type of Jesus, that his feelings here as the righteous man who's suffering pointed ahead to Jesus. Not that Jesus existed at that time, he didn't pre-exist as a person, but Job's experiences were pointing ahead to the Lord Jesus. And he was the classic case. He was brought down that he might be lifted up. This is the symbology of baptism. We go under the water, like we die with Jesus, and then we come up out of the water, like his resurrection. And that process of death with him and rising again, of losing and then winning, this goes on in your life. Just keeps on and on. This is what we sign up to. And it will come to its full term when the Lord Jesus comes back and we are literally resurrected. He says, 20... 19, all my friends hate me and are turned against me. Now that is the word for adversary. All my friends are my adversaries. I said the word Satan means an adversary. So I certainly think that the friends were something to do with the Satan. It might, they may have been manipulated by um, an angel or whatever, but all the same in practice. And this is the worst thing. When your family, your friends... In his case, his religious friends in the church or whatever, that turn against you. My bone cleaves to my skin and to my flesh, he says. That's just Jesus on the cross. And then he comes to this wonderful thing at the end. I know that my Redeemer lives. Well, the idea of a Redeemer, this is the Hebrew word that, that really means my relative. And the idea under the law of Moses for Jewish people was that if you fell into hard times, you could be redeemed out of that by a close relative. If, if, for example, a man died without children, his redeemer, his relative, was to marry his wife and have children in his name. So the redeemer was a close relative, someone in your family, maybe your brother. 
And he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And he's talking about God. And this is the incredible idea that we can be that close to God, that we have him as our closest friend, as family. Now, the God who is so far away, so far away, can be that close as a family relative, the one who is going to save me, that big brother of mine who is always going to come to my help. Then he says, and I know that he will stand or be raised up at the last day upon the earth. Well, the Hebrew word for earth there is not the land or the earth as in the planet, it's the dust. So I think that he's looking forward to a day when there would be raised up somebody out of the dust on God's behalf who was going to save him. And that person was Jesus. Moses had said that God would raise up unto them a prophet like unto him, who was Messiah. And then he goes on, and though after I'm dead, uh, worms will destroy this body. So he clearly did not believe in an immortal soul. He believed that death was unconsciousness and that his body would be consumed. Yet, in my flesh I will see God, not in my spirit, but in my flesh I will see God. So I can only understand that as the hope of the resurrection of the body. And that is indeed what the Bible promises. That for those who are baptized into Jesus, who have identified their body with his body, his death, his resurrection, they also will be resurrected. And in their flesh, in our flesh, that is in a bodily form, we will see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold him and not another. This is an incredible teaching, that God is, let's say, corporeal. That is, that God has a bodily form. Because we are made in the image of God. Not in his mental image, because we are far from God. We've got to bring our minds to be like him. But we are all the same, made in the image of God. And so, although a lot of people don't agree with me, I don't mind that, but I suggest to you, it is... My, it's for me to suggest and for you to accept that God is a personal being. I don't mean that you can define God too closely, but I, I'm saying that God is not a cloud, that God is not energy. God is a personal being, and he has a personal location in heaven, whatever heaven precisely is, but there, if you like, God is. And we are in his image. And we are told here that, Paul, uh, Job says, my eyes will behold him, and I will see him for myself. And that is the light at the end of the tunnel, that we, if we are baptized into Jesus, if we have uh, remained in Jesus, that we will see God. And you get this at the end of the book of Revelation, when all is said and done, that we will see him as he is, and our eyes will behold him. That we will see God. Paul says in Hebrews, you should have holiness now, without which no man shall see the Lord. Isaiah 33, our eyes shall behold the king in his beauty. And we will see the land that is now far off. So, he says, I will see him for myself, and my eyes will behold him, and not another, not another person. And I think what he means by that is that my relationship with God is totally personal, absolutely personal. And you can't enter into it. Nobody else can. And it's picked up a little bit by Jesus in the New Testament where he says, when I come again and I welcome you into my kingdom, I will write upon you a name that nobody knows apart from you and me. And a name in Hebrew thought was really a, a character, a personality. And so what he's saying is that we have that totally personal relationship with God and with Jesus that actually nobody else can enter. So although in one sense salvation is collective, it's also individual. That you and I, as the mass of all the experiences we've been through, as the personality that we are, that we will be resurrected in a, as the totally unique persons that we are, 
and will relate with God in his kingdom here on this earth in a totally personal way. And no one else can enter that relationship between you and God in that sense because it's totally personal. Just as people have been married a long time, got a good marriage, you can't enter that relationship. It's between those two persons. And so it will be between us and God forever. This is what we mean when we say that the Lord Jesus is our personal saviour. This is what we mean by personal relationship with God. And that is why the way I might exactly understand God is not going to be the way you do. And that's why you can't sort of conspect all this into some sort of uh, uniform statement that we all are going to just have exactly the same relationship with him No, that is not the the nature of relationships, if you see what I'm saying. So, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes will behold him and not another. Uh, I think that's absolutely beautiful. And, you know, even in this life, we get a foretaste of that. Because right at the end, some of Job's last words in Job 42, verse 5, he said... I've heard about you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Now my eye sees you. But he says here, I will see God for myself at the last day when I'm resurrected. And yet he says that in essence, I have that experience now. Now I have that experience through repentance, through accepting that we are not quite who we might appear to be in the eyes of society, and through getting in with this program of God to bring you down that we might be exalted in due time and he says these wonderful words and then he ends in 28 and 29 talking to the friends he says you should say why are we persecuting him seeing the root of the matter is found in me be afraid of the sword for wrath brings judgment etc know that there is a judgment and I think that that's him appealing to the friends I think it's him saying look you're no better than me the root of all this stuff is in you as well as in me and remember that there is a a judgment having spoken of this wonderful personal hope that is beyond my words or anyone's words to explain that is that we shall see God that we shall look at him and have this personal relationship with him that nobody else can enter just you and him alone, forever, in that sense. Uh, in, in view of that, don't judge your brother. That's what he's saying to the friends. Remember that there's a judgment. Remember that you, might, that you might miss this, that there's an eternity, not only you know, a physical long line of eternity, but relationship with God that you might miss. And so it is, because salvation is not universal. There must be some election. There must be some choice in this world. And so, wrapping up then, whatever you're going through, whether you're being persecuted by your friends, and I've suggested that that the Satan was the friends of Job in in reality, in practice, I think that's who they were, Um, within the, the church or outside the church, collapse of health, being despised by people, unfairly, as it seems, being brought down. Uh, Life just not working out as it should, by rights, work out for you. Don't be surprised. This is all exactly as it is intended to be. Because if if it wasn't that way, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be with the Lord. Because you'd be having the kingdom now. And it wouldn't be a very great kingdom anyway. God is bringing us down because he loves humility. That's what he he wants more than anything. That he might lift us up in due time, as Peter says. And that due time is not now. It is when the Lord Jesus returns. And so through going through all that, Job ended up very similar to the Lord Jesus on the cross. And so it is with us. Through all this stuff, we come close to him. And if we suffer with him, as Paul says, we shall also live with him. And so we take the bread and wine as an act of identity with him. As we were baptized into Jesus, so when you take that bread and wine, 
that is a symbol of of the body of of Jesus, and that in a very little way becomes part of you physically. In the same way as we are connected with Him, we we do this to show our identity with Him. That yes, you suffered. You had a life that, humanly speaking, didn't work out. You died and resurrected, and you are my representative. I also will go through the same pattern with you. So, let's give thanks for for the bread and take the take the bread. Lord God, our heavenly Father, we think of the Lord Jesus in His time of need, His time of suffering, and we try to see similarities between Him there and me here this morning. We pray, Father, that in your love and grace, you will allow us to identify with him, with his sufferings, with his flesh, so that when he comes again, we truly shall rise from the grave and live forever with him and share in his eternal glory. So we do thank you, Father, for this bread and for all that we see in it of your Son and of your grace and of your desire to include us and to be with us. For Jesus' sake. Amen.